Hey, what's up, guys? Toogie here, back again with another episode of my Ottawa Senators franchise mode series right here on NHL 18. Now, it's been a couple of days between the last upload. Normally, I don't like to date these episodes. I like to just kind of act like, hey, every day it was uploaded like I wanted to be. Uh, obviously, the upload schedule has slipped. I will say, uh, check out my Twitter as an explanation as to why. I'm sure you'd understand at that point in time. But still, I don't like that the upload schedule has been slipping. I don't like that I flat out missed a day yesterday, and I mean, it's understandable too. I'm not going to say there was any frustration, but even from my point of view, having to go a few days between having an episode of this when we did so damn well in the first round, absolutely stomping the Tampa Bay Lightning, it was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, we had some underperforming players. The top line wasn't perfect. As you would have seen, we had some players like Eric Carlson put up... <laughs> it's still unbelievable to me. He put up 12 goddamn assists in four games. Absolutely unbelievable. And that leads us to today's episode. It's round two. We have home ice advantage against the Carolina Hurricanes a team. That has uh, given me trouble this year in NHL 18 in general. So I'm pretty damn nervous about this. Let's take a look at the team. Our lineups have remained the same. And we'll see what we are up against. Wow, Kevin Roy is on... Now, this is completely off topic, but man, Anaheim's lineup right now is interesting. What's their defense look like? All right, still pretty good. They got Matt Grizzly, too. Damn, a Boston influence with them in Seneshin. I wonder what trade that was. Carolina, here we go. This is the team we're taking on here in round two. The top line of Tavo Teravainen. We have Yanni Gord and Sebastian Ajo. Just so you guys get a look at the attributes. Ajo with five points, Gord with three, and Teravainen with seven. How many games did they play in round one? They played five. So that top line is performing pretty well. You have Michael Furlan, the second line left wing, no points so far this postseason, centered by Elias Lindholm. Uh, he has been he's been an interesting player in the history of my channel. Uh, whether or not he's he's not quite a dad enough to me, because we've had him on our team before with mixed success. And when we come up against him in the playoffs, he is either invisible or or Gretzky, Crosby, Ovechkin all blended into one on horse steroids. So hopefully, it's not the latter in this series. Julian Gauthier rounds out the second line, also scoreless. So that makes me incredibly nervous that their second line has been somewhat ineffective. The third line, and honestly, I'm surprised they don't use a different combination with Lindholm. He's next to two more physical players, but regardless, third line is Victor Rask, centered by Jordan Stahl. You get a look at his attributes so far, or at this stage in his career. And Lars Eller, they round out that third line. I still say Rask, Lindholm, Gauthier, Ferlin, Stahl, Eller. That's a really good combination. Not to give them any pointers, and hell, they might not need it. They might kill us. We'll see what happens. The fourth line is Lucas Walmark, also scoreless, with Riley Sheehan, the Sheahans, and Morgan Frost, also scoreless. You know what this means. The lack of points from all of these players, whoever their goaltender is at this point, is a world beater. Like, we're looking at, like, a 970 save percentage minimum for this goaltender. The defense also looks pretty damn good and is what you would expect the Carolina defense to look like, with the exception of TJ Brody. But we start off with the top pairing. It is now 91 overall Noah Hannafin with two points so far this postseason on a pairing with Justin Falk. The second pairing is the previously mentioned TJ Brody with Jacob Slavin. Up to an 86 overall. And the third pairing is 83 overall Jake Bean with Brett Pesci. That's a very good defense, but I am so nervous for this. By the way, no injuries, but three healthy scratches. All defensemen, Roland McCown, Trevor Carrick, and Hayden Flurry. The goaltender is 82 overall Scott Darling. The backup is Nadelkovich and his amazing eyebrows. How good is Darling's save percentage? I knew it. 
Did I not tell? Did I not say it? Did I not say it? Minimum of a 970 through five games, four wins, a 973 with a .8 GAA and two shutouts. Take that smirk off your face, Scott. I'm not a big fan. 82 overall, and he's putting up those numbers. Nadelkovic has not seen the ice so far this postseason. Oh my God! If you want, if you want a way to concern me, you found it. Because Scott Darling is playing like a goddamn man possessed. We had solid goaltending in round one, but a 973—that is insane. Shostyor can put up a 944. Who did they play in round one that they just so easily stopped? I don't understand it. How is Scott Darling that good? Oh my god, it had well, it could have been Boston or Florida, I suppose. Who was it? Let me see. Whoops, I meant well, I think yeah, playoff tree. Regardless, they beat Boston in five. So are the Bruins now I know I'm taking a long time to get into the sim. I'm sorry. But these are questions that need to be answered here. Like, are the Bruins just Completely inept offensively? How the hell did they get shut down by Darling? Marshand, Heinem, Pasternak, DeBrusk, Bergeron, Ritchie. So Nick Ritchie ended up in Boston. Matteau and Riley Nash and Peter Solarek, Krejci, Fitzgerald, and Trent Frederick. Defensively, Krug, McAvoy, Braun, Carlo, Folan, and Killer with Tuka Rask still between the pipes, who did very, very well. Now Vladar's the backup. I, I don't get it. I'm concerned. This seems like the type of series that could go very, very poorly for us, despite how well the first postseason matchup went the first round against Tampa. Regardless, it is time to get this series underway. Round one, or round one against Tampa, that's in the books. Round two, you see how I try to cover it as if I didn't misspeak? No, I flat out misspoke. Round two against the Carolina Hurricanes. Game one. Here in Ottawa, first period is scoreless. 11 shots to 8 in our favor. That really kind of scares me. Second period, and we get the gigantic first goal in this game. Who else but Nikita Gusev? He gives us the one nothing lead as we head in to the final 20 minutes of regulation. Colin White adds another one as Slavin gets it right back under two minutes later. It's still 2-1 lead. Power play opportunity, Nikita Gusev. Makes it three. So Colin White's goal. Oh my God, Scott Darling gets beat from center ice. The the far side of center ice too. Oh my God, he got beat from our blue line. Unfortunately for you, Darling, you're not playing the Boston Bruins anymore. You are playing the Ottawa Senators featuring the Nikita Gusev, Colin White, and Mark Stone, and I don't think you are prepared for it. Three point night for Stone, 27 saves for Igor Shestyorkin, and the game winning goal from Colin White. A three goal third period caps off a hell of a first game. We take that first game, we defend home ice, and move to 5 0 oh this postseason. And there you go. I just jinxed it. I know. That's all right, though. I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling confident. I believe in this team. Let's get game two underway. There's no time to waste. First period of game two. And it's a goal apiece. Sebastian Ajo scored under six minutes in. Colin White gets his second goal of the series. Tying it up just before the midway mark of the first. Dead even in shots as well at ten apiece. Second period. And the Hurricanes take the advantage. Morgan Frost and Riley Shea and it's 3-1 Hurricanes, and that puts us into an interesting spot. We have 20 minutes to turn this around, or the Hurricanes would have accomplished their goal of winning a game on the road to begin this series. It's time for our big-name players to step up, particularly that top line. We're over halfway through the third period, and Scott Darling has returned to form. Three, make it four, one Final. Stahl adds the empty netter. The Hurricanes bounce back, flip the script, reverse the score. 33 save performance from one Scott Darling, a goal for Shane and Frost. And as I mentioned, the Hurricanes have accomplished their goal. They took one of the games on the road to start this series. 
And that's going to at least lead me to looking at the line combinations right now. I'm a little bit concerned about the lack of production from the top line, despite, you know, Nikita Gusev's numbers. Like I said, five goals there. The second line's killing it. The third line, I mean, Logan Brown's a little bit quiet. Just a little bit in the fourth line. The point totals haven't been great, but I'm very happy with the plus minus. So I, I can't break up the second line. Dropping Barzal is insane, but it might make sense. Duchesne and Ronning have proven to be a good pairing. That second line is killing it. Gusev is still putting up points. Barzal, yes, has three assists, but he's the only minus on that line. My one thought is if I drop Matt Barzal, what is the... Off, you know, what's not necessarily the offensive outlook, but what's that defensive outlook going to look like? Huh. That would be the move. I don't know if I'd want to move Duchesne off of center because he's doing well. And I could move Borgstrom back to the middle. What do we have to lose? Logan Brown's not putting up points on the third line. Barzal isn't, I mean, he's doing okay, but he's still not performing to a Matt Barzal level. And you know me because of the handedness. This is why I'm making this move. I'll move Duchesne to the left. We'll try. I mean, Duchesne, Barzal, and Ronning as the third line is absurd. But if we can get it to work, it's worth it. So Brown, Borgstrom, Gusev, Jost, White, Stone, Duchesne, Barzal, Ronning, Paul, Smith, and Gagne. The defense will, in fact, remain the same. Then on special teams, the power play is still the same with Barzal having that prime time spot. Let's see what happens. It's not so much Logan Brown getting a promotion. It's more Matt Barzal being sent a message that that's simply unacceptable. It's time for Game 3. The series shifts to Carolina. We are tied at one apiece after losing our first game of this postseason. And this is huge. For the momentum, we have to do the same thing now. We have to take at least one of these games on the road. Let's hope we can bounce back. So here we go. First period of game number three. It is scoreless. They outshot us 12 to 10. Second period is not scoreless. Colin White, that second line is unreal. God, that second line is so good for us. Colin White strikes again. From the looks of it, from where he scored, he front kicked Scott Darling into the pits. And just, yeah, that's a, that's a 300 reference. We're up one to nothing as we begin the third period. We're still being outshot, but so far so good from one Igor Shestyorkin. All right, come on now. Halfway through the third period, can we hold on? An insurance goal would be nice. We have a power play opportunity, a chance to do so. An extended power play, please? No? Okay, that's fine. Two minutes left. Can we hold on? Yes, we can. And Logan Brown, of all people, gets the empty net goal. A 35-save shutout for Igor Shestyorkin. And the Sens have accomplished their goal. We have taken a game in Carolina, again, the 35 saves. Shut out. Darling was great, 27 saves, but it's the one that he didn't make. Colin White with the game-winning goal. His second game-winning goal in three games. That second line, I could not be happier with. Oh, my God, there was an elimination. No, it wasn't an elimination game. Or was it? I, I completely forgot about our AHL team being in the situation. Uh, they lost the first two games, but have won three straight. So, Belleville has a chance to eliminate Binghamton in Game 6. But our main focus will still be on the NHL series. But the better that team does, the better for our franchise, the better for our prospects to continue developing. Now here's the thing. I kind of, I wish Kevin Fiala was back. I do. If Kevin Fiala was back, Logan Brown probably wouldn't be in that scenario. It's up to two points and a plus four. We're okay for now. I mean, Kevin Fiala's just gone, period. So that's, that's unfortunate. 14 points now for Carlson. Only two points in three games. What a slowdown. What a drop-off in production. Regardless, it is time we'll find out if Belleville have ended the series against Binghamton in six. 
but it's time to focus on the main series. Game four in this Eastern Conference semifinal matchup. Can we take that commanding 3-1 lead, or will we face a tied series as we head back to Ottawa for game five? Let's find out first period of this game. And again, we split the goals. Lars Eller and Ryan Ellis gets on the board. They outshot us 9-4. to So that's a huge accomplishment to at least walk away with a tie at the end of 20. Huge goal there for Ryan Ellis. Second period. Oh boy, that's conflicting. Matt Barzal finally gets a goal this postseason to give us the lead. However, Jacob Slavin tied it, and with two minutes and nine seconds left in the period, Michael Ferland scores from a pretty rough angle. Three goals on 13 shots for Carolina. We have two goals on 12 we're down, heading in to the third period. We need a big-time performance here. We have an early power play chance that we cannot capitalize on. Carolina has a quick five on three. We're just trading power plays here. Nobody can score, and we're halfway through the third period. We have another power play chance here. Come on, we, we can do this. Please, it's over. If we're not scoring on that power play, we're done. I would be shocked if we scored here. Yeah, that's it. Our power play, unable to make it work. This series is tied after four games. The Hurricanes take game four by the score of three to two. Michael Furland with a two-point night. Lindholm with two assists and the goal for Slavin. The Hurricanes have battled back. Did we win in game six? We did not. So the AHL series is going seven. Belleville and Binghamton and we will follow along. Let's do this. Can the AHL team stay alive? First period, and Will Bitten gets the opening goal on Ian Scott. We're down one to nothing. Second period, Jake Evans made it two. Casey Sezika scores on Jordan Bennington. We're within one. The season's on the line here in Game 7. Will the Belleville Sens be eliminated? We have a power play opportunity that we can't take advantage of. That's becoming a theme. We have another one that we cannot take advantage of. Will Bitten just scored his second of the game. And that'll pretty much be all she wrote. The Belleville Sens have been eliminated in seven games in the second round. The Binghamton Devils move on. That is a very, very disappointing end to their season. Let's hope, let's hope we have a bit more of a positive outcome here at the NHL level. But still, I'm okay with the second round playoff. Actually, I'm not okay with it, but it's better than them having not made the playoffs whatsoever. My thought here, what do we do with the power play if it's not working out? And I know exactly what we do. Jost, White, and Stone, they need to be made a combination. So let's see if we can figure that out, because that is... Pairing has been unbelievable. Gusev's a righty, so we can't have him there. We need a lefty. The problem is we don't have enough lefties. We're going to have to take someone out of this. We have one, two. Yeah, see, we only have two lefties. If I want that perfect pairing, I might have to switch it up. Although having Gusev there might not be the end of the world. Having Gusev with that, yeah, you know what? That's the way to go. And then we'll have Ronning, Barzal, Borgstrom, Duchesne, and Ellis. That's that's all right. That's looking pretty good. And we'll see if those changes can help lead the way to success. Yep, yeah, that's fine. We'll go with it. As we prep for Game 5 back in Ottawa, we need to win here. Make no mistake about it. This has to be a win so let's see if we can get the job done. Maybe the new power play can finally get going as well. First period of game five, and it's another goal apiece. Yanni Gord and Henrik Borgstrom. So Borgstrom gets on the board, which is pretty nice. We outshot them 14-7, to though, doubling them up, and they walk away with the tie on the scoreboard. It's tied, but that's advantage Carolina. To have been able to be outplayed but still walk away without losing. They have the advantage heading into the second period. What's going to happen? And we have the lead. Mark Stone makes it two. Furland ties it 30 seconds later, but Zach Smith, the fourth-line leader, 
gets the goal to give us the lead yet again. It's 3-2 sends. We're out shooting them 28-15. to You'll notice, too, Smith, all three goals that period were from terrible, terrible angles, really. Outside shots prevailing. We have the lead, though. That's what's important. Third period, an insurance goal would be nice. Not that I don't have faith in our defense and Chest Yorkin. It's just a general statement. Power play chance for the Canes. They can't capitalize on it. Seven minutes remaining. Can the Sens and Chest Yorkin hold on? No, oh, they can't. Jordan Stahl with a minute and 50 to go has tied this game and has forced overtime a clutch goal from one of their veterans, someone with an amazing amount of playoff experience, at least that comes to mind. I don't know. And then again, since he's been in Carolina, maybe that playoff experience has kind of has kind of cut back down a little bit. Point being, the veteran gets the goal. We're in overtime here in game five in what might as well be a must-win game. 38 shots to 29, three apiece on the board. The overtime challenge, Gabriel Gagne or Lars Eller. Let's do this. Can we get the win here? Early power play chance for Carolina. Justin Falk with the goal pushes us to the brink of elimination. Mark Stone was the first star of the game somehow. It is 3-2 Carolina in this series. And needless to say, I am feeling the pressure as Belleville just gets their starting goaltender back. Too little, too late. I am worried. Extremely worried. We now face an elimination game in Game 6. I don't know why I keep scrolling so far down with Carolina. I want to check the goaltending, of course. Gee, he still has a 9.54. We are getting dominated by an 82 overall, Scott Darling. <sighs> line combos, right? We need to put forward the best lines. The, the team that gives us the best chance to win. I just don't know if I want to move the second line up to the top line. Because they're doing so well there, you know? I have a combination. You might think I'm crazy, but I have a combination. We're going to go Gusev. Oh, God, do I want Barzal on that top line or Borgstrom? Borgstrom has seven points. Gusev can't play center, but he's naturally a left wing. Gusev, Borgstrom, Ronning. Let's try it. But then again, I don't want to... I don't. You know what? No. I don't want to mess up Duchesne and Ronning. Gusev, Duchesne, Ronning. Duchesne and Ronning have proven to have some good chemistry, and Gusev's still a point getter. I'm going to make Jost, White, and Stone the top line. And we will have Brown, Borgstrom, Barzal. Fourth line stays the same. We're desperate. For anyone who thinks I'm changing up the lines too much, remember there isn't actually a chemistry system with that. It's... It has nothing to do with how much your lines have played, you know, on the same. It doesn't matter how much time Logan Brown, Borgstrom, and Barzal have spent playing together in the season. That's just, that's not how it works. Unless you have definitive proof through data mining that proves otherwise. <laughs> it would be nice if that's how it worked, if there was an actual chemistry system. I mean, there is the whole player morale of, oh, I like this player, but don't like this player. But that's about it. And as it is, the morale system's off. Defensively. I mean, Dobson and Foote have been okay. Obviously, Foote and Timmons had done well. I'm just worried that, I mean, Carlson's still putting up some points. He and Shabbat are still doing okay. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I'm going to go Ellis and Carlson. Shabbat, Montour, and then Foote and Dobson have been okay. And we know Chest York is still the best way to go. Based on how players are performing, in my opinion, these are the lines that give us the best chance to win and we have to win two straight. If we fall from here, I don't know what the future holds as it is for Matt Barzal. But if we especially fall off here, there might be some changes coming. We talked about this year about going for it. And that's what the acquisition of Ryan Ellis showcased. If we fall flat here, we'll have some big decisions to make in this offseason. Game six in Carolina. It's a must win. 
Can we get the job done? Let's find out. First period. And we get the opening goal. It's Nick Paul, the fourth line, chipping in. We were outshot 13 to 10, but we do have the lead. A gigantic goal for Nick Paul. And I'm so happy he scored that goal because we stuck with him when we could have traded him a few seasons ago. Second period is scoreless, which is just tremendous for us. 22 shots to 17, but the only thing that matters, 1-0 on the scoreboard. 20 minutes to go in Game 6. Again, insurance is key. We're going to need the extra goal. Michael Ferlin ties it. Matt Duchesne regains the lead for us. 10 minutes to go. Again, an insurance goal would be nice. Can we please make it more than a one-goal game? Under five to go. Can we hold on? Can we force game seven? Colin White with the empty netter. Jost adds another one just to rub salt in the wound. 4-1 final. The Ottawa Senators and Carolina Hurricanes will go to game seven here in round two. What an effort there as Ferland tied it. Duchesne, the empty netter for White, and then somehow nine seconds later, Tyson Jost adds another one. It's another three-goal uh, another three goal third period. 29 saves for Igor Shestyorkin. Two points for White. Two points for Tyson Jost. And it all comes down to Game 7 back home in Ottawa. Our season is on the line. The winner will go on to play the Philadelphia Flyers, who beat Pittsburgh in six over in the West. It is Winnipeg and Dallas. Ridiculous. Carlson still leading this team in points, 17 points in 10 games. We're keeping the lineup the same. We won with it. We got to go with the lineup that got us here. Game seven. No reason to hype it up. Any further than that, Game 7 speaks for itself. Let's go. Season on the line. First period here in Ottawa, and it's a goal apiece split. Elias Lindholm showing up at a crucial time for them, but Nikita Gusev gets the goal back. They outshot us 14-8, to but we're tied. Advantage slightly to the Sens heading into the second period. Speaking of which... Second period, and there we go. Eric Carlson gets his first goal of the postseason with 12 seconds to go in the period. 25 shots to 15 in favor of the Hurricanes. 2-1 to one on the board for the Sens. The captain shows up at a huge time. And we're 20 minutes away, but it's going to be a dogfight. We need that insurance goal. Barzal, Borgstrom, step up. This is your time to prove yourself, Tyson Jost. Screw the other ones. As long as we have the Jost white stone line, we're good to go. Another power play chance for the Hurricanes is killed off. Under nine minutes to go. 3 1 lead for Ottawa. Under five minutes to go. And oh god, a power play chance for Carolina. They score with 44 seconds. Sebastian, oh, but that's it. Oh my god, Sebastian Ajo scored with 44 seconds to go, but it was too little, too late. Tyson Jost's goal at the beginning of the period holds up as the game winner. 35 shots to 23, but 3-2 to two on the board. Your sends survive one hell of a scare. We are going to the Eastern Conference Final, where we will play the Philadelphia Flyers. Just Yorkin with 33 saves. What an effort. Two points apiece for both Jost and Eric Carlson. Oh my god. <laughs> we somehow survived that. And of course, we already knew we are playing Philly in the Eastern Conference Final. They will have home ice advantage in this series. And again, Dallas and Winnipeg are over in the West. 57 wins for the Flyers. They won the President's Trophy. I am so eager to look at their lineup, but we will wait until next time. For now, all you need to know is we are moving on, mainly due to the efforts of Igor Shestyorkin in this top line. We need a name for this line. What do you guys think? 
We need a name for this line. But Tyson Jost with 14 points. Colin White with 12. 15 for Mark Stone. This line is the reason why we are here. What an addition, by the way. We didn't want to trade Mike Hoffman. We kind of had to. We get Tyson Jost in return. Holy hell. <laughs> was that just was that the right move to make? He has worked out tremendously. The second line at the moment, Gusev, six goals and ten points, eight points for Duchesne and seven for Ty Ronning. But then we get to the third line, three points for Brown, seven for Borgstrom, four for Barzal. I think it's a bit ridiculous that Ty Ronning is equal in points with Henrik Borgstrom. That is certainly cause for frustration that these two big name players aren't the ones leading the way. Go figure. The moves to sign Borgstrom and Barzal haven't exactly worked out in terms of playoff production. They are not producing. So, I've kind of had a history here of bringing in some big name players and having them not work out, and that is proving to be the case. Nick Paul had a gigantic goal. Five points for Smith, three points for Gagne. That fourth line is tremendous. As long as they have that positive plus minus, the defensive effort that they bring, the grit that they bring, what a team this is proving to be. Of course, Ryan Ellis up to a plus four now. I'm, I'm loving it, man. I'm loving it. This team could have something special. We are doing this without Barzal and Borgstrom looking like the players that they are capable of being. If they are able to get it together for the rest of this postseason run, we may just be able to slay the dragon known as the Philadelphia Flyers, but we will not find out if that is the case until next time. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Again, sorry for the delays between episodes. I'm trying to get back. You'll understand if you look at Twitter, but I'm trying to get back to that normal upload schedule as quickly as possible. For now, once again, I will thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. You know what you can do to support the video. Leave a like, subscribe, click the bell, or ring the bell, as some people say. All that fun stuff. Links are in the description to my Twitter and Twitch. Check me out on both of those platforms if you have not already done so. On Twitch, we're approaching 6K subs, or 6K follows, I should say. 6K subs would make me a very rich man. We're approaching 6K follows, which is great. My one-year goal was 5K. And on YouTube, we're approaching 10K follows, which was... My three-year goal, we're a couple months out, we're on pace to hit it, and that's because of you guys, so thank you for that. Have a good one, take it easy, I'll see you next time. Go Sens!